everyone to the Nine Springs Valley Interceptor McKee Road to Dunn's Marsh presentation. Thank you for joining us. My name is Rachel File. I'm a project engineer with the Madison Metropolitan Sewage District. And I'm Kevin Lord with MSA Professional Services, a uh, project engineer that uh, working with MMSD on the project. And we are hosting uh, this presentation today to share information and to hear your input on this project. We will run through our prepared presentation and a link to the online form will follow. And in that form, you can submit feedback and any questions that you may have. So with that, let's get started. The Madison Metropolitan Sewage District was created in 1930 by state statutes to protect the environment and to treat wastewater. The district now serves almost 380,000 people in the cities, towns, and villages in the Madison area. Wastewater treatment for the entire district is performed at the Nine Springs Wastewater Treatment Plant. Now, let's take a look at how the wastewater gets to the plant. From your home or business, the wastewater flows out through a pipe called a lateral before it hits a bigger sanitary pipe. From there, it connects with other sanitary pipes at manholes and eventually goes to an even bigger pipe called an interceptor. And the interceptor takes the wastewater to our plant to be treated. So basically, again, the interceptor sewer that we're talking about here today is a big pipe that takes your wastewater to the wastewater treatment plant. Now that we've talked about what an interceptor sewer is, let's talk about how specifically uh, the waste in this area that we're talking about gets to the treatment plant. So um, today there's an existing sewer, an interceptor known as the Nine Springs Valley Interceptor, shown in blue, which picks up wastewater and takes it to the plant, which you can see is over there to the east. The existing portion we'll be focusing on today is highlighted in yellow. And as you can see, that area we are focusing on is north of McKee Road and west of Dunn's Marsh. So let's go ahead and let's zoom in on the yellow section. The existing interceptor there is located along the Military Ridge Cannonball Bike Trail corridor. The portions highlighted in yellow are the sections we need to replace due to their condition and their capacity. So let's first talk about the condition. If you've ever used a pit toilet or had the luck to be around wastewater, you know there's an odor. The odor can be from the breakdown of waste material, which creates hydrogen sulfide gas, also known as H2S gas. This gas tends to gather in the pipe and corrodes away certain materials such as concrete. Unfortunately, when this interceptor was installed back in the 1960s, it wasn't known that the H2S gas would corrode the concrete material. You see the white areas in the photos? That is the corrosion um, on the concrete pipe itself. And where there's a darker grid-like pattern at the top, that's where the steel on the concrete is showing because of the corrosion. Aside from the pipe condition, capacity is also driving us to replace the line. In most cases, that means that the pipe needs to get bigger. Here's a picture of our anticipated capacity showing each interceptor segment of the Nine Springs Valley interceptor in this area. The yellow shows the portion of the interceptor that we anticipate reaching capacity between 2025 and 2030. That portion we definitely need to replace. Just north of it, you can see a dark green portion that shows um, that there we have a little bit more capacity. Um, and so that portion, actually, we're going to be skipping because it looks good to us and um, that it was replaced back in the early 2000s.
And so to show you on the map, that is this area here that we're going to be skipping. Um, again, this is that area to the south that the um, capacity was very low and the condition is really driving the replacement up here as well as some capacity. So now that you understand the portions of the Nine Spring Valley Interceptor that we are looking to replace, again, the portions in yellow, let's talk about what construction might be like. So here, um, an interceptor sewer is typically installed with an excavator. There will be signage to signal that the trail is closed and the depth and width will vary. Pavement will be restored and repaired after construction. In most cases, an interceptor is installed by digging a trench to lay the pipe. If you've ever dug a hole before, you know what typically happens is as you get deeper, the top of the hole gets wider. This same concept happens when the construction crew digs the trench for the pipe. Typically, excavation is wider at the top and crews will actually slope the soil back to make it wider for safety reasons. The interceptor relies on gravity to carry wastewater. This can lead to trenches of varying depth. And in some places, digging a trench would cause a lot of disruption. In those locations, trenchless technologies can be used and the pipe is bored underneath. So one example for our project is where we're hoping to use trenchless technologies is at the roundabout. We know that it's an important connector to the trail and we're hoping that we can keep it open by boring using this trenchless technology underneath. So how it works is there are two pits. There's one here where you basically send the pipe, you push it under or you bore it under. And then there's one pit here that receives the pipe. And so that's a little bit of how the trenchless technology works. And so while we're talking about the trail, for those of you who are familiar with the stretch of trail, you know that there's only um, a few connecting roads, mainly in the southern part here. This uh, portion of the trail to the top um, is pretty isolated in that regard. There's not much access to get to the pipe to replace it. The best way we've come up to access this part of the trail without driving through the roundabout and disturbing things is to actually come east from Seminole. So if we're coming east from Seminole, that will extend our project um, area a little bit, but again, that's for access. And you might be thinking, well, if you're going to be getting to this portion, how are you going to how are you going to do that on the trail? Um, you know, you wouldn't want to drive on the wetlands or maybe the wooded area. How would you do it? So actually, the best we thought about this, and the best way would be down the trail itself. So even though we'd like to avoid impacting the trail, in this case, it's really the best option to get materials in these hard to access places. So unfortunately, that will mean um, that the trail will be closed in this portion, but we do have some ideas to share today regarding detours. Here's a diagram showing the potential detours. The idea is to keep portions of the trail open as long as possible before closing it. For example, when work is occurring in the yellow portion of the trail here, Users could take this dashed yellow detour to get around to connect at the roundabout, which again, we're hoping to keep open for connection. And likewise, when this portion of the trail is being worked on, users could take this dotted orange line to get from Seminole Highway to the roundabout. Now, there might be a time when we are working in the roundabout area trying to send um, pipe from one side to the other. So there might be a time where we have to close both the yellow and the orange side. And again, trail users would just need to take the full detour route. So that kind of gives you an idea um, of what potential detours there might be. We would notify biking organizations and put up advanced signage 
similar to what Dane County Parks has done in the past. So with that, uh, while we're talking about the trail, we do have a unique opportunity to potentially improve the trail. If we can find the means and the funding to improve it, how should we? So this slide shows some ideas that we've come up with that might be um, potential improvements. Um, so some of those might be everything from partnering with B Cycle to provide a station or to smooth out trail connections on the on and off ramp. Another potential option might be solar lighting at the roundabout or wetland improvements, enhancements, trail markers marking um, perhaps the mileage on the trail or other signage, um, wayfinding signage in general, native species restoration and invasive species removal might be another opportunity or perhaps like placing more benches. So while we're talking about what improvements we could make, um, it's also important to understand what is there currently. So if you have ever ridden the trail, you know that right here at the roundabout, um, there is some signage already. There is a bench, um, a kiosk, an awning there. Um, you also may or may not know, this one's a little, um, a little off the beaten track, but over at the turnoff near Sprocket Drive, there is a existing bike repair station, there's a water fountain and a bench there. Um, so there are some existing facilities already along the trail. Um, and so the kind of the question for you is, what would you like to see? And if you can vote for two of them, which ones would you vote for? Or maybe you want to, you have a different idea. We are open to that as well. And so um, following this presentation, there will be a form in which you can provide feedback um, on these um, improvements. And so I encourage you to uh, visit that form after this presentation. Also, um, we are also looking to share today and looking for any feedback on where the new pipe should be located. So again, this is a replacement. So in some fashion, we're gonna have to put in a replacement pipe. Um, so with that, I will turn it over with Kevin who will run you through the different alternates. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, uh, again, this is Kevin Lord with MSA, uh, working with Rachel on this project. And I guess we just wanna go through um, some alternates that we've been working with with MMSD on a new interceptor location. So we've got it split into two sections. Uh, there's a south section and the north section. We're gonna start here on the south section, which is basically, if you remember Rachel's um, diagrams on the two yellow portions, this will cover the portion from McKee Road, basically up to Sprocket Drive. So um the first option obviously for the most part this is a hundred foot wide corridor uh throughout so we are anticipating the work basically trying to stay within that hundred foot wide corridor or very close to that so the first option on the south section was to replace it where it exists currently um and this map shows basically with the star where it starts um, where there's a structure that exists um down by mckee road and then it basically heads north and as you can see, it basically gets very close to the westerly um, edge of the right of way on this section. And actually, as you uh, traverse farther north, closer to Sprocket Drive, it'll even go beyond the right of way. So this was the first option. Um, we'll go through a table here at the end that basically shows um, some of the alternate uh, comparing the two or the three different alternates that we have. Um, and some of the pros and cons for each one. Some of the cons uh, for this one is there is a lot of bypass pumping as in the sewer that flows there right now, if we were to replace it in kind, would have to be pumped around um, and kept moving as we did the construction. So that is a, that is a big concern um, to make sure everything keeps going as well, as well as uh, maintenance from MSD. It is farther away from the path, a um, little bit harder for maintenance uh, for future things. So with that, we looked at two other alternatives, basically one on each side of the path, um, but closer to the path and to try to keep it away from the private properties. Uh, the first one we looked at here is on the west side of the path. 
So kind of splitting the difference or getting closer to the path, but in the right of way uh, between the existing path and the right of way. And as Rachel said, for access and everything, we are anticipating the path will be closed. Um, some of the concerns with this location is more on the southern end down here um, along Certco. There is a an existing water main pipe um, that they've got there for fire protection um, that would have to be considered. MMSD along this entire stretch basically has a, an existing force main um, for uh, which is an effluent pipe from their treatment plant that pumps back down uh, treated water um, that exists. And then if we put it here, we'd also have to look at the um, location compared to the existing pipe. So there's a lot of things in this corridor along with a retaining wall along the bike path um, down on that southern end as well. So um, that was those are some of the considerations and they'll show up on this chart as well um, toward the end. The last alternative was basically crossing basically on the east side of the path um, closer to the path as well. Main concern with that is obviously we would be crossing underneath the McKee Road um, overpass for the bike uh, trail right there and following along kind of the closer to the ditch line path area uh, on the east side. There's a lot less as far as utilities. Uh, the ramp itself for the bike path would definitely be uh, impacted and have to be replaced as part of it. Um, but there seems to be a lot less impact for utilities along that way. And we can make it more accessible for MMSD to uh, for maintenance in the future, as well as getting it away from some of the private property things on the west side as well. Um, as we go farther north, we would have to cross the path at a certain location. We'll obviously have to look at that um, as far as you know utility conflicts and where to exactly cross, but we will have to cross to get to match back in before Sprocket Drive. And our intent out of this is to, in all intents and purposes, hopefully not disrupt Sprocket Drive, or if we have to, it would be minimally. Um, based on how we can make the connection with the existing manholes at that location. So um, those are basically the, the, the three options here on the south end. And then I think the um, last slide here, yes, has the uh, some of the alternates. Basically just some things um, that we tried to look at all the way through. Um, some of the factors we considered, um, obviously cost, um, maintenance as far as how close it is to the path for the MMSD to maintain in the future. Um, utility conflicts, there is going to be some utility conflicts, um, probably in both um, directions, but they're definitely more concerning, it seems like, on the west side right at the moment. We know that there's going to be detours, as Rachel mentioned, um, for construction as well. Um, the gravel drive next to Certco is also a fire access, so there is concerns with keeping that open during construction if we stayed on the west side. Um, obviously, impacts to the retaining wall. Um, and then the path entrance uh, down to McKee Road. So those are some things. Bypass pumping, as we mentioned, there would be some, there's some anticipated wetland disturbance and we do have a wetland delineation that's planned to be done here uh, once the DNR growing season starts. However, obviously the information we have right now is strictly based on um, available information at the moment. And it appears some of the wetland disturbance on the east side is mainly some of the stuff on the ditches. It's not uh, the highest quality of wetlands at the moment, but that will be determined as well. Obviously existing connections, we'll be looking at those. Um, some of the MMSD manholes have existing connections in them already. Those will all have to be maintained, whether we um, you know, go on the east or west side, any place we have to put in uh, new ones, these all have to be maintained unless an owner tells us that uh, they're no longer valid and, and we don't need to. Um, one of the big things we did look at is some some construction time, um, talking with some contractors, just giving an idea because we know the, the path closure will be, um, you know, is considerable for a lot of people. So kind of looking at rough construction time ideas, um, you know, barring decent weather and everything else. Pipe sizes will be looked at as well. Um, some of that is uh, an internal discussion as to whether the MMSD would either consider lining the existing, which then a new pipe would, could be possibly smaller and they would have dual pipes, which means more maintenance for them as well. Um, but either way, a new interceptor would be planned through the corridor, it's just a, a sizing issue then as to which one. And then um, 
you know, looking at easements, obviously we'd have easements. Uh, some of this property is owned by the city and we'd have easements through that, but to try to stay away from some of the private property as much as we can. And then as Rachel showed in the screen before, just some of the ideas, uh, getting some rough ideas on depth, if there's any considerations between the three of major discrepancies between them. So those are some things we kind of looked at um, as we were kind of going through this process. And um, I think now we'll go to the north section, which basically starts at the private drive that runs into Thermo Fisher. It starts on the south side of that, and then we'll run north and then northeasterly through the roundabout to uh, basically Dunn's Marsh. And we also have three alternatives that we kind of looked at here. A lot of them are, you know, to some degree similar. The one that uh, first we're just going to show you here is the existing where the existing interceptor runs. And due to its location, we did we did look at this alternative. However, we've kind of um, ruled out trying to replace it in its existing location. The red line that uh, that's up there right now is where it exists currently, which for this portion of the project is basically outside the right away of the path all the way throughout. And as you start going here on the east side that's shown, you can obviously see the, the disruption to a lot of the um, apartments and buildings up along this north side. So due to that and some of the depths through there, we're trying to avoid putting it back there. And if possible, try to get it back within the path corridor. Um, we just think that's uh, better for everyone, better for maintenance for MMSD and just to get it out of the private property um, throughout the corridor. So. So we kind of looked at some of the same alternatives. Uh, first alternative is kind of on the north, northeasterly side of the path or northwesterly side of the path. Um, basically trying to get it closer to the path. There is some, uh, some wetland potentials. That's the areas in blue. Some of these are just ditch areas. Um, there is some utilities we'd have to look at. There is still a, a force main that runs through there. And as Rachel mentioned, we would try to, our intent on all three of these is to try and bore underneath the Badger State Trail through the roundabout area um, if possible. Um, and then there is some utilities obviously as well along around by that roundabout as we go through. Um, and then as it goes farther east, I believe there'll be some wetland areas there. We'll be crossing some, um, there's like a little uh, storm outfall on the easterly side here that we'll be crossing to get back into where we're basically tying back in. So that was one option. Other options basically staying on the south, southeasterly side of the path throughout. And same, there's still some utility conflicts throughout. There'll still be some um, wetland disturbance throughout it uh, we do have some concerns um, on the north side I guess is to the ATC poles that run through there which this avoids staying on the south side of the poles um, there's just some distance clearances that we have to meet if we follow that as well so um, but then we will still be crossing some wetlands that I assume will be there that aren't shown on here from the available information as well so we'll still be dealing with that stuff as as well throughout um, then the last alternative it's similar to the first two it basically just kind of goes back and forth across the path in a couple locations where we think we can make it a lot easier access for mmsd um, keep things closer to the path eliminate some of the wetland disturbances farther away and closer um, to the corridor right away still boring underneath uh, the badger state trail but as well trying to meet clearance distances throughout and basically trying to like I said just make it more accessible through uh from msd as well throughout so um those are kind of the three alternatives not including obviously the existing location that we looked at so we do have a spreadsheet as well on that that goes through some of the alternatives and some of the factors we looked at there obviously the an estimated cost at this time um some wetland disturbances if we stick closer to the path we think there might be a little bit less of wetland disturbances and maintenance obviously closer to the path allows MMSD to utilize the path throughout and um, maintain the sewer without having to uh, you know, get off the path for a ways. Pipe sizes, similar to the south section, that'll be determined. We are planning on putting a new interceptor there, whether 
we would keep the existing one and have this alternate one, which if the existing one stayed, that would be one additional pipe that they'd have to maintain, which is also in private property easements throughout. So that would have to be looked at, but um, we are looking at a new interceptor either either way, it's just then we can, we'll that determine the size. A lot of the other items on here are all the same throughout. There's definitely some utility conflicts um, that we'll have to work through that, uh, and some impacts, and we know there's uh, the detours. There definitely will be some trees and brush removals. We do have an arborist on site or on board as well that's planning to identify trees in the corridor to help uh, help us identify those um, prior to you know identifying the exact path as we go through. Um, we will have to cross the Thermal Fisher private drive, so we'll be working with them uh, on that crossing and if we need a temporary access or different things through there. There's a few more existing connections in this stretch. All those will have to be reconnected as well, no matter which route is anticipated. And then the easements, obviously, if we can maintain and stay within the, the corridor, we just deal with those entities and we can hopefully not worry about as much for private property easements as well throughout. It's possible we still may need some temporary ones for construction, but long term it would uh, it would get some of this pipe out of the private property easements. So, and then also looking at construction time and depth um, throughout the project and just overall for the uh, detour routes and looking at the the overall time frame and everything. So, the construction times on here. Are just for those segments so technically the construction time on here of 18 weeks would have to be added to the previous construction times which were i think in the range of 12 weeks and in that range um, for the total project as well which i will now turn it back over to rachel and she can talk about kind of some timing on these things thanks kevin appreciate it um one thing before i move on to timing just to mention is the colors that you see on this chart and the previous chart we did try to highlight in green kind of like the best of each category so like here you see like we've highlighted the 2.7 million because it's the lowest amongst all three alternatives so that kind of gives you a sense of maybe which ones um maybe make the most sense um in terms of the different alternates um but then you kind of see here the bottom factors are really all in common for the three so with that um talking about schedule uh, here is the project timeline. So we will be selecting an alternate this month for our route. And once we have the um, route selected, we'll be spending time designing and engineering the project all the way through August, approximately. During this uh, design period, we will also hold another public informational meeting. And after design is complete, we will solicit bids from area contractors. And prior to construction, we will also hold a public pre-construction meeting um, later this year. Um, construction is anticipated to start uh, track in November, December of this year, and going for a full year into November, December of 21. Um, and during that time, we are coordinating with City of Fitchburg, Madison, Dane County Park, trail users, residents, businesses to, um, to get feedback. Um, also want to mention that we are coordinating with other construction projects and other projects in the area. And those are shown in gray here. So we know that the Capital City Trail is going to get repaved um, um, this summer as well as McKee Road construction continuing on until this fall. There is an, um, an upcoming stormwater study for this area um, conducted by City of Madison, City of Fitchburg, Dane County. Um, and so we're also working with them as well. Um, and so with that, um, that's really all we have for you that wraps up our presentation today. If you have any comments or questions and to vote on the potential trail improvements that you'd like to see, we have the link here where you can go to to view that form. We are allowing a one week for feedback um, it, or for voting, and that will end after March 27th. Uh, below is our contact info, um, should you need it. And thank you for your time. And that concludes our presentation today.